Good evening from Brisbane um, and our friends over the world. My name is Martha Liu. I'm the curator of this exhibition, Manfred Shani, Love, Art and Legacy, and the moderator of this webinar series, A Story to Unfold, the Movement of Chinese Contemporary Art in the 1990s. Before we start, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be given this opportunity to host a webinar with my colleagues, Johnson Jiang and Karen Smith, whom I've known for many years. Um, it's, it's like having a get together with old friends and where we can reminisce the old, good old times in Hong Kong. And we talk about the, how the whole uh, Chinese art movement started in the 90s. Uh, just let me just uh, give a little bit of introduction of our guest today, uh, Johnson. Um, I think some of you may uh, who study Chinese contemporary art would know who Johnson is. He's the founder of the uh, Hana Tizek Gallery in Hong Kong, and he was a pioneer in introducing Chinese art to the international audience in the 90s. And he's the man who curated some of the most memorable exhibitions, uh, including the Stars 10 Years in 89, China's New Art Post 1989 in 1993, and The Power of the Word 1999. Um, Johnson was also responsible for curating numerous international exhibitions, including his participations in Sao Paulo International Biennale, Venice Biennale, and the Guangzhou Triennials. And also on the panel, we have Karen Smith joining us today. Karen is a well-respected scholar and curator in China. In fact, Karen and I have uh, actually worked together many years ago on one of the um, Chinese art publications. Um, history of Chinese oil painting from realism to postmodernism. And back then we just started out as a curator. At that time, I was based in Hong Kong and she was based in Beijing. She was the former director of OCAP's Contemporary Art Museum. Um, she was also the former advisor to the Shanghai Center of the Boy, currently running the uh, curatorial fellowship program there. And, and Karen is also a very prolific uh, writer as well. So that's a little spill of our speaker's background. And next, I'd like to give a little quick rundown of the program. And first, I will give a, a little bit of an introduction what, why we're doing this, and followed by a series of questions to our guests two guests here, and then a short introduction. And um, and also we will ha have a, a Q&A session where I have actually allocated 20 minutes uh, at the end of this webinar, and hopefully we can finish this uh, series in 60 minutes. So without further ado, let's go with the fun of the program. So just a little spill about uh, the, the background about China um, during the 90s. So the, the 90s was actually a very transformative year in China. Um, the country experienced relatively social and uh, political stability after 1989. Economically, China was enjoying a healthy economic development. Uh, the significant improvement in living conditions in China has proven the effectiveness of Deng Xiaoping's uh, reform. Uh, 30 years ago, living standards before the reform were really different. Um, uh, for example, like television and refrigerators, they were uh, considered luxury items back in those days. Um, and uh, the most common mode of transport was actually bicycle. So they didn't really have many cars there. And around 40% of the household um, was still regarded as poor in 1991. And fast forward to the 21st century, where we have seen the last 20 years the, uh, is the increase in income has led to a rise in the middle class and affluent class in China. And it is projected that middle class will continue to grow in the foreseeable future. Currently, the middle class constitutes about 56% of the entire populations. So uh, in respect to Chinese contemporary art, it also happened around that time. Uh, the, the movement was developed and evolved based on political, economic, cultural, and social circumstances. And while the existing literature tend to focus on the, the, its development within China from an institutional perspective, um, the panel today, we will be talking about how um, how this movement was actually developed inside and outside of China from historical and non-institutional point of view. So I have actually prepared a set of questions, six questions. I hope that we can get through it. So let's start with question number one. Um, and so we, we all know at that time um, uh, when the whole Chinese art movement developed in China, it wasn't just in China alone. Um, also Hong Kong as well, and contribute to its movements. So Johnson, my question to you, okay. Maybe you can tell us about uh, what was the uh, the cultural environment in Hong Kong was like in the 90s. 
and and why you started um, focusing on Chinese contemporary art. For example, you uh, when you curated the the, the phenomenal uh, exhibition post um, uh, post uh, 1989 New Art in China that was in the Art Center. It is actually considered one of the most significant exhibitions in uh, Chinese art history. Can you tell us more about it? Why you started the whole thing? Um, my curatorial career really started in the late 70s and early 80s, right at the beginning of the 80s, uh, when I uh, when I uh, identified some artists in Hong Kong and Taiwan who I wanted to promote to as a, as an example artists who did not come back to uh, to to their hometowns to create uh, from uh, from a, uh, uh, from a training that started. From the West, because modern art, as we all know, um, is essentially a development out of uh, Western modern civilization, and it's, it uh, became uh, internationalized to all the countries that um, had, uh, were ambitious to modernize. And China was definitely one of them. I mean, China had been trying to modernize for for a century, and uh, um, and art as the uh, uh, as the aspect of um, of um, um, modernity that shows um, the cultural, uh, cutting edge cultural development um, necessarily um, becomes the, uh, the, the kind of high ground people want to look at the place. But in Hong Kong, art was not the high ground. Uh, the, in fact, there was no snob value of being an artist. Um, in, uh, when artists tell people their, uh, their career as an artist, then people know, know know exactly that that what it means it means that you can't get a job and you're actually not doing anything of uh, of great significance so my interest in um in, in this um comes from two two things firstly artists who get recognized are people who are trained mostly in the west so there was there was almost like a repeat of creative movements let's start in the west and uh, this is uh, the case in hong kong and even more the case in Taiwan because Taiwan, uh, in of um, being um, being um, a national country, was conscious of developing uh, its uh, its modern arts program. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, there were a lot of artists who were promoted uh, to, uh, as modern artists who were trained from abroad, and they were and their experience was used to to identify what was modern art. So my early uh, career was interested in the 80s, was trying to find uh, artists who I feel uh, had escaped, who, who are not escaped, but who actually comes from, uh, comes from uh, what is most unexpected, which is not the academic um, uh, um, sphere, uh, trained also outside. Um, and come, coming back to to develop a kind of a system of thought and a system of, of art making. Uh, rather, there are people who actually uh, have an urgent uh, um, cultural messages, urgent emotional um, uh, messages, uh, urgency in trying to grasp to come to grasp with some forms um, uh, of art they want they want to uh, to to. Um, to 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 express and to articulate as art. So um, I was interested in artists who showed part of a tendency of, of almost like an outsider, and uh, uh, or artists who were very steeped in local folk culture. So in Hong Kong, I was interested in people like Louis Chang, uh, who who always lived lived in Hong Kong and who always I was interested in what was happening internationally, but he interpreted everything from his experience um, very much from the street level. Then uh, I was interested in, from Taiwan, artists like, um, a naive artist like Hong Tung, or an artist who was trained in folk carving like Zhu Ming. So I was trying to find people who um, give us, um, who give us um, a sense of what it meant to be modern from um, from home experience. So that is how I started to got, get interested in art from uh, mainland China. Um, mainly that these were these uh, very diverse movements that happened in uh, 1984, 85, 86, the, the, what we call now by Gao Minglu and Li Shenting, 
they identify it as the 85 new wave. Mm. And uh, for me, they have a similar, they come from a similar kind of background in the sense that they, uh, a lot of these artists um, started to do contemporary indigenously. They are doing these also in a collective creative uh, basis. So there are many art clubs and they're trying to, uh, they, and these art clubs basically gave uh, people with creative urge a context um, and also a, a social milieu to make art. And I, and I believe uh, at that time, this was um, what made possible many of the interesting art movements. Then of course, um, the, one of the earliest was the SARS art group. And um, while I was doing um, exhibitions for artists from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and some mainland Chinese artists who passed by Hong Kong, um, I wanted to um, find, an, find, find a way to enter into the art history of mainland China. And uh, uh, the 10th anniversary of the, the STARS group seemed to me um, a, ver uh, a very um, a useful way to enter into uh, a, a, to, to a retrospective it meant um, a lot in in revisiting what happened within the 10 years after they started, not only themselves, but also the other people for the, for the 85 new wave. So this was really the, what led up to what, what um, I did in the early 90s. Yeah, I, I um, sorry, I thought I was mute. Johnson, just very quickly, because um, my understanding is because uh, obviously, you know, there weren't any government at that time uh, supporting these artists and groups and things like that. And your your gallery, obviously, is a private gallery. And I, in, in my mind, it's it just it, it is quite a brave thing to do as a, a private gallery decided to, you know, to promote artists in such a way and doing, you know, what you're doing with the, uh, the stars group and all of that. Um, I thought that was quite interesting. And um, yeah, it is actually, you know, you, you're at the right time, the right place, obviously, uh, you know, starting this conversation about Chinese contemporary arts. And, 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 and do, do, do you feel that way too at that time or were you not thinking about it? Yes, I think um, I've been always thinking about institution. Uh, I've been thinking about institutions all my life. And uh, today my interest is also very much interested. Uh, uh, my interest is still very much about institution because um, uh, these all these artists I, I, uh, that always attracted me um, from the uh, 70s and 80s onward are artists who actually started to create before there was a suitable institution for them to exhibit. Mm. And uh, uh, mm. in Hong Kong also, uh, from the 70s, uh, by the 70s, there were basically two institutions uh, that showed art. It was the Hong Kong Museum of Art, and it has a mission to promote uh, modern art um, in Hong mm. Kong. Mm. Uh, this has a, also the mission to, uh, to showcase what is considered modern from the traditional uh, Chinese literati tradition and find the modern uh, uh, descendants, uh, successors to this very major tradition. Um, but then I, uh, so I thought that this work has been done, um, mm. especially for as an official institution supporting a lineage mm. that is uh, clearly identifiable. But mm. then what do you do about all these creative urge and mm. also this interesting creative form, mm. which, uh, which, uh, which is um, very much, which very much has the foot on the ground, but mm. do not have institutional framework to either, uh, which to, to either show where they came from, uh, nor uh, to show uh, how they can be situated within um, an institutional framework. So for me, um, the private gallery would be um, uh, would be like a platform that that is um, that is re re relatively free, and you can do whatever you like. Um, but of course, that freedom uh, coming from a uh, from a mercenary society in Hong Kong um, has this has was one very important um, uh, has this very one important requirement, uh, which is that you need to find a way so that you can do it on a shoestring. Mm -hmm. And uh, I happen to be given the space uh, to play around with for for over a decade, and uh, um, I, I pay 
uh, practically nothing. So uh, so I only need to pay for my own uh, my own keep, and uh, that was what made make this possible. So even the so even the, uh, the the manner of running this commercial gallery uh, is outside was outside of this kind of uh, even commercial institutional structure, and that yeah. was what made it possible for the first decade of um, this career. That's that's incredibly fascinating. I, I think a lot of people see this commercial gallery always makes money, but that's not the case, obviously, you know. But the institution also very, the very interesting thing. I think um, the stars is also a very interesting thing that you mentioned them. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you think of institutions, a way to uh, think about art and, and, and experimental art, um, the first, um, the first, Stars exhibition in 1979, when they uh, did a huge, this famous protest march, and which uh, Lo Hung Sing made these famous photographs um, of these artists. They actually ended up exhibiting their work on the fence outside the National Gallery. And then the next year, when they did the second Stars exhibition, the artworks was exhibiting inside the uh, the, uh, the uh, inside the fence, inside the um, National Art Gallery. So I think that was actually quite symbolic. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in Hong Kong also, a lot of these artists started as uh, um, uh, as uh, artists exhibiting outside. So they were outsiders. In some of them were truly outsiders, like they were naive artists, like Hong Chong or uh, uh, in China, like Wu Feng Yi, who, who uh, Long Marsh discovered later on. Um, and then uh, there was Ling Yuan, a naive sculptor from Taiwan, who were, who were great artists. Um, so they, they were outsiders. But in fact, uh, the avant-garde artists were also outsiders in, 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 uh, in a sense of the word, which was actually in, in, the, in the 80s. Um, and this was actually very different from artists since the 1990s, because artists from the 1990s, uh, especially artists which, who ended up in the post-89 exhibition. Um, they, were, they, were, they, were, they all have the foot within institutional, institutional cultural framework. I see. They, they, they were all artists, all of them are artists who have training within the art academies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so that I think is a very big difference between the stars, between even the 85 new wave and mm -hmm artists um, be, uh, be, between these guys and artists who, who were selected to be in the post-89 exhibition in 1993. Okay, okay. Thank you, Johnson. I'll, um, I'll just, um, I've got a second question to, to Karen, so I'll just let her to jump in and I'll come back to you later. So Karen, thank you for joining us. Um, I have actually made a little bit of introduction already. Karen and um, Johnson and Karen, <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. whether you have met. Have you? Oh, yes. many, many years ago. Yes, in fact, I know about art uh, in China um, a lot because of uh, Johnson's early generosity with <laughs> showing me art when he was preparing for the uh, post-89 show. Wow, fantastic. And I'm so pleased to see you this time after so many years. We worked together on the book. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that was, that was quite fascinating. <laughs> okay, so a quick question to you. So I understand you've been living in China since 92. So that's you know, the, the whole, yes. yeah, long time ago. And you also obviously written a number of books. Um, so tell us, um, tell us your take on the emergence of the Chinese contemporary art in the historical non-institutional context. Can you tell us more about it? Because you live in China, so you know everything there, right? <laughs> right. Um, that's such a big question. So just to bring it down um, a little bit to a more kind of manageable level, I think that the, um, the big, beginnings, which is a little bit as Johnson was just describing, you know, just the fact that artists were doing things and, and the doing something was really the most important impetus from 1978 or the late 1970s onwards. And that didn't, at that time, everybody was so kind of the same because society was that way. You were equally poor, you were equally, um, equally fed or equally employed, whatever. So people didn't differentiate so much um, between sort of the different status of artists and the, just coming together for the joy of creating was something that really drove um, a lot of what was happening. And whether that was the stars 
or whether that was artists within the academy system who were trying to do something different. And it was that will to do something other than the very strict teachings of the academy, which really drove the energy. So in that sense, doing something was really important in terms of bringing people together, I think. Um, and of course, it was great to be able to show the art, but I don't think that um, having an institution was the first thing in people's minds because China didn't have institutions. It, it, it never had. I mean, it had places where you saw the National Art Show. And of course, the National Art Show was a big deal, but things like this were a function of propaganda in many ways. They weren't a function of aesthetics in, you know, in, in terms of sort of like how we enjoy art museums today. It was a, it was a different um, mechanism. And I think that the way that artists went through the academy system also was a function of the teaching of a certain style of art that was geared towards communicating a certain kind of message and was not about encouraging artists to fully create. So the kind of, you know, energy that was happening was when people were in their private homes or when they were together in unusual spaces and they put on their own shows, you know, like a lot of what happened around the 85 movement, uh, the energy came from people like Huan Yongping and Shaman that were doing things outside, that were demonstrating um, in a public space or a space outside of a, a, an institution because, you know, I guess one reason was that they couldn't get inside. But I think just the fact of wanting to be different was also part of um, what, what also brought people together because as the 85 movement moved towards 1989, um, which was when Chinese art did have its first kind of institutional survey, which was mm -hmm. the exhibition called the, 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 the big kind of China avant-garde show in the um, National Gallery in Beijing. Um, there was a lot of debate around that because a lot of people felt that creativity, if it wanted to be different from what the system was offering and what the system was suggesting, that it shouldn't necessarily aspire to be in an institution that represented everything that the, uh, that the system was um, dictating you know, would be that sort of socialist realism, a certain kind of positive attitude in the art and very strict ideas about, you know, oil painting or printmaking or sculpture with very little crossover or space for people to, to, to experiment within the system. Right. So of course, all that was happening outside the system. So there was a lot of debate about whether or not the institution that existed within China was relevant to what an avant-garde should be doing, which is why the mm. artists were so thrilled when they got opportunities like the ones given, you know, by um, Johnson with the show in Hong Kong, which traveled, you know, and others that went to Europe. That was really exciting because that seemed to be part of what was considered to be a real art world that dealt with sort of, you know, art world issues that weren't blatantly political or uh, propaganda or just you know, about communicating a specific message. So I think that, you know, we see through the 1990s as well that most of the interesting things that were happening in the most dynamic shows happened in the basements of buildings or courtyard houses somewhere, you know, it was, it was a real mishmash, but it was about that energy of people being together something which I think is really what drove such a hive of activity and exciting new thoughts and creations. Mm -hmm. I think I think you're very fortunate to be the witness of that development. <laughs> yeah, it was great to be here. So exciting. Okay, so I've got a question number two, Karen. Um, can you tell us about the cultural environment within China at that time? Because I understand, um, I think the um, the National Artists Association actually was formed in 1990 and obviously trying to develop some sort of a national narrative uh, for the arts. Um, and um, did it have any impact on artists and organizations at all? And, and how did they respond to it? Can you tell us about it? Well, I think the system um, was very organized right from 1942 when Mao's first idea about what purpose the art should serve. Mm. So there were places where you could study art and mm. you have to remember that at that time, the numbers of students in each class were very small. You might have, I think like in the 85 um, 
kind of uh, at, at the National Academy in Hangzhou, there were only probably 10 people in the class. So it's a very small number of people given the population of China. We're talking about very small people indeed. And the aspiration of many of those artists was to be employed at what was called like a painting institute, not institute, which was basically kind of an, uh, an association for artists to admitted you have a student, you would have a studio, and should be required maybe once a year or twice a year, kind of a, a commission. The line was propaganda, but the rest of the time you could be left to do your own work. So, uh, all these associations, do not hear me. Sorry, Karen, just maybe uh, what I suggest is to turn off your camera because it might chewing up the data. And um, uh, so we could actually okay. hear you better. Yeah, just switch off your camera. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. See the button on the, yep. Okay. So uh, there were always associations. So, for example, in 85, when uh, Chiang Pei was organizing the New Space Exhibition, which was one of the pivotal events of the 85 new way, that was actually supported by the Art Association in Georgia. And so there was always a need if you wanted to do something that was with a public space or the public sphere, then you would need to um, have some kind of official support. And in that sense, the artist associations would be supportive. Um, the artist association was also supportive in 1988 when they had the big uh, Huangshan conference, which was very important to the forward motion of contemporary art. It was at that conference when the content of the exhibition in 1989 at the China Art Gallery was decided. So these associations were, were, were useful, but at the same time, they were still quite um, conservative, as you might imagine, because they had to be. They belonged to the government side or the official side of the cultural expression <laughs> of, of the country. So they had to make, make sure that what was being expressed was suitable. Um, and that remained very much the role. But I think that part of the times uh, from the 80s to the 90s that was most exciting was that people were aware or perhaps the need to change. And there were always um, officials within the artists association who had sympathy for the artists, who were willing to support them. And some of the artists, like even Wang Guanyi, when he graduated, he was given a position in one of the uh, artist institutes in Zhuhai. And that's where he spent the first two years of his career. And it was actually because he was a member of that Dan Wei, you know, that official organization you that know. he was actually able to officially invite um, a number of contemporary artists or avant-garde artists to go to Zhuhai, where they had the first small-scale conference to talk about new ideas, which was basically to talk about the 85 new wave. Um, and that sort of gave encouragement for organizing the one in 1988, which was in Huangshan. So all of these things are connected. Um, and I think that it's both the creativity of the individuals involved, their ability to network, to use a more familiar term today. Um, and that kind of camaraderie was really uh, important for, for how the art world developed. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Karen. Yeah, it's a very interesting story here. Um, so I'll go to question number three uh, to Johnson, your turn now. All right, so um, what we can see is the, um, the public institution and outside and out inside of China uh, play a significant role in promoting Chinese art. And what is your opinion about the role of the commercial gallery and their contribution to the movement? And what about auction houses? What do you think of it? I, I think um, co commercial galleries and auction houses came, came late, quite, uh, quite a bit later. Um, the, uh, uh, the commercial success of artists, um, of contemporary artists, um, did not really happen quite quite a bit later. Even though there there was a market um, starting from outside of China, mainly uh, starting in the early nineties, because of these of these um, exposures, and then people who who wanted to know more about 
uh, contemporary China, um, they got interested in collecting art. Um, they were not uh, astronomically priced, and um, they, uh, they they were bre- uh, they were there was a breath of, uh, of fresh air for uh, for the art world, and uh, uh, in Hong Kong um, also in 1992 at the end of 1992 uh, was the, was the, was the first um, uh, gallery art fair um, in Hong Kong, and. Um, that gave a platform to uh, to galleries um, to open up the the commercial galleries. Um, how would say the the to open up the audience for for commercial galleries. But but just before that uh, happened in Hong Kong, um, Liu Peng at that time uh, uh, had had this uh, great scheme that um, it was uh, that he believed that um, like uh, if the West actually managed to make artists so important so famous it is because of this of the support of the commercial world so he started um also an uh art fair in uh in guangzhou at the time also r- around 91 90, 92 it was so um this idea of how uh commercial uh uh entities uh can be the support of, of, uh, of this cutting edge uh, experimental creativity was in the air in China as well. Um, but um, the, the great success really did not come until, uh, until the noughties, 2003, 2004. And uh, um, that by, by then, the, the, uh, the position of, of these artists as, um, as creative figures in, in, con- in modern art history um, the the, uh, the positions in the art world uh, was already very well established uh, for the Chinese uh, artists of that generation. They had already uh, exhibited in some of the most uh, um, most desirable um, platforms internationally. Uh, Venice Biennale, Sao Paulo, even the Documenta, and uh, many many museum shows. Uh, in fact, they already found themselves in places where even Western artists had uh, had to struggle for uh, for for many years before they find themselves um, in that in that lucky position. So they they had actually uh, uh, in the 90s achieved what would have given uh, what would have made um, them uh, possible to be uh, to be artists for. Uh, for, for for gallery promotion, so so in a way it happened in reverse. They became famous before they were promoted by the commercial. Whereas whereas in for, in most cases uh, it is the other way around because uh, the galleries uh, should have been the first the first exhibition site for many artists when when they leave art school. Mm. And uh, well, no, I mean of of course Hanna is a commercial art gallery, but then. Uh, um, when I did the, a, a lot of these shows in the '90s, um, many of them, many of these w- went on to um, to uh, biennales, to, to museum shows abroad. So um, they don't come back to my gallery until like three three years, five years after they, the the exhibitions were launched. So uh, e- even in in my experience, um, there is this this there is this to stagger it. Um, uh, kind of a, uh, um, how would you say, um, th- this, this one when we expect how, uh, this natural uh, sequential development art it was, was not 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 quite the, the case as uh, one we expect. Is it, is it? You're saying it's not quite conventional. <laughs> uh, it's not very conventional. No. no. <laughs> oh, very fascinating. Yeah, it's going sort of like reverse. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll jump to question number four to both of you, um, Karen and Johnson. So besides um, public and private institution that they have played a role, um, I think some of the others like um, um, uh, Su Bing, Chai Guo Chang, and Gu Wenday, they, and even like the late Chen Yifei, uh, they all moved overseas uh, during the 90s, early 90s, uh, in search of a different environment. And how do you think about how they actually contributed to the movement? These others, individual others went overseas and do their own thing in overseas and all of that. 
So Johnson, maybe you can tell us. And then Karen. Uh, well, okay. Well, my experience uh, with these artists is uh, they, uh, a lot of them actually started to work again within from come back to China to work with uh, artists from China because they realized the interest um, uh, internationally uh, on Chinese art was because they are from China. They are from place which people imagine to be uh, closed off and it, uh, China was closed off to, to most people. So it was this mystique that gave a lot of Chinese artists this huge advantage. So some of them come back uh, to, to start to work from, from there. Um, but, I, but I think um, uh, artists like Xu Bing, Guan Da, um, uh, uh, Chai Guochang, much less, um, but Huang Yongping and a lot of artists, most artists actually uh, traversed um, China and, and the Western abode in order to take advantage of the opportunities on, on both sides. And uh, curating from uh, the West, I think Ho Han Ru really did uh, the, the, uh, one of the greatest contributions because Ho Han Ru uh, was very devoted to his friends in, in France. And uh, he, um, he also is very devoted to his, to his pals from, uh, from uh, the compatriots from Guangzhou. So, um, he made many, many of these exhibitions as an international curator to support these artists in, in Europe in particular. So that was also very important, having um, a Chinese curator on, uh, on the ground in, in Europe. Then, of course, uh, other curators like Karen uh, or like uh, uh, Julie Andrews, who, who later on worked with the uh, Guggenheim, and many... Um, uh, people who know about Chinese art living abroad uh, also, also helped. Um, but all in all, um, they are artists who already uh, have a reputation inside of China or within the art, uh, art institutions. The only uh, black horse I think would be Chai Guo Chang because essentially he was uh, trained in Japan. And uh, so he, uh, he in a way, he came into the whole Chinese art scene uh, uh, very much like as, as a, a self-made kind of a, a cause. And so I think he was, he was actually particularly interesting. And also, um, he, uh, he also made, made a point that he, you know, was in, not interested in uh, gallery exhibitions. So uh, his, uh, his platforms have, um, have mostly been museums. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Johnson. Um, Karen, is there anything you want to? Yeah, because I think that actually some of those artists that went abroad, abroad perhaps offered kind of like a role model to some people back home, but there were actually many more artists who had opportunities to live abroad for, for a greater or lesser period of time. And so those who were li already living abroad actually provided a lot of support for visitors who came to stay or pass through, but they also provided another very essential role, which was that they sent back both a large amount of catalogs and books and articles. Um, and they also brought back things themselves. And these were really important for kind of giving the, the artists who were in China a window on the outside world that was not a window that you might otherwise get. You know, you might uh, receive things from, from, you know, like the kind of selection you might see in a bookstore, but if you had somebody who really knew the subject, they might offer you a different selection. So that kind of circulation of information was really important because sometimes it would be an article that was a key article about painting, for example, or installation. Mm -hmm. And people would photocopy it and distribute it and it would be read so widely by people. And the artists themselves, when they came back, because they had actually seen shows in galleries or museums in, you know, like you're across Europe and across the US, they were able to explain what they were seeing to artists in China and allow for discussions that otherwise wouldn't have happened in the same way. Um, people could really ask questions and really kind of like say, well, was it any good? You know, why was it? good what what makes this and these kind of discussions were things that people couldn't have in other circumstances because 
even with visiting curators and artists in China would be a little bit, you know, uh, embarrassed to be so direct to actually ask a question about, uh, you know, a Western artist or, or, or an artwork. But these artists provided a great um, source of inspiration. And you have to remember that even people like Xu Bing actually brought resources back that he provided the funding for a, num a number of publications in China um, that were the first to compile what was happening in terms of conceptual art. Mm. Um, they were eventually books that were done by Ai Weiwei, the black cover, white cover, gray cover. These were actually instigated by Xu Bing, who, who found somebody who was willing to support them um, to, to do this. And, and that within China, the fact of having that book was really like the first window that conceptual artists could see what other conceptual artists were doing when they often didn't have opportunities to present their work in public arenas. So I think that that role should never be overlooked just in terms mm. of community, because that, that was really a very important uh, impetus from the mid 1980s right through to the end of the 1990s. Mm. It's certainly some sort mm. of a uh, cross-fertilization happening and uh, yeah, in yeah. that context, I mean, and yeah, that's how, how the whole diversification happens, really, uh, you know, yeah. having cross disciplinary, you know, practices mm. and all that, how artists expanded their practice. Great. Okay, so let's go to question number five. I thought that was an interesting question, and I, I can't help myself but to ask you. Okay, so it's, um, do you think the, the whole narrative of the contemporary Chinese art movement is being told by institution presents some sort of an unbalanced view of the art ecosystems? Um, I think there's a tendency for academics not to talk about it because they always regarded, you know, private galleries as commercials. Um, so what do you think of that? And should we have uh, more conversation about this uh, as we do not see the whole picture? Uh, and what can we do to uh, to address this imbalance? Maybe uh, Johnson and Karen, you can, or Karen, maybe you're on the screen, so okay. maybe yeah. you can start first. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I definitely think that there is uh, an, an imbalance and not one that anybody consciously tried to create, but because in the very beginning, Chinese artists themselves and even the critics didn't have a voice in the international arena. And that's primarily because there was no English. And so a critic writing in China would very, very rarely have their works presented in English. You know, it would happen in exhibition catalogues like the ones that Johnson did or, and, you know, but these weren't necessarily distributed in the way that, you know, in, in an art magazine, you might get distributed really widely. So there was a, a little bit of a one-sided possibility to really, you know, read on the surface. And I know that coming from England, we had a very, you know, it, it's ingrained in everything of education. You were, and we didn't even learn that much about China, but somehow we have certain perception of the East. And these things are always inherent then. It took me years to try and dismantle the kind of uh, ingrained ideas that I'd been you know, taught, taught about China to try and really see things from a Chinese perspective. And that is very important. So for example, you know, when, when, when Chinese artists themselves were invited to go abroad, certainly the older generations, they didn't speak English. And, and then it was very, very difficult because the translation process, when there's a group, is always quite difficult to manage. It's much easier one-on-one, -on -one, perhaps when you're having a, a discussion with a curator but when you're in somewhere, even like Venice, you know, when you've got 10 artists and people want to know or talk to the artists, it's very, it's very difficult to, to really get their perspective. And of course, then we end up from the Western perspective, Europeans would make very reductive assumptions, perhaps, about what they were seeing in the work due to what they thought they knew about China. But the artists actually might have a slightly different perspective, but, you know, in translation. So I think that what's happened now, which is really very positive, is that we have younger generations of scholars in China, who many of whom, including the younger generation of artists who have a board, who are as comfortable speaking English as they are Chinese, and who are very much more open to debate and discussion. And in a world where now we are challenging many narratives. So I think that out of that, we see a lot of young people looking at the history I'm really trying to go and interview people, talk to people, dig up 
kind of the stories of the past and rethink them in the China context. Because I also think that one thing got lost is, you know, what did China want from a contemporary art scene? You know, we, we've seen it sort of adopt a lot of Western practices and Western ways of being, but, um, you know, it's kind of never been clearly articulated what, what would be China's worldview, you know? And I think without having that as part of the discussion, um, from this point forward, um, it, it seems to me very urgent that, that that becomes part of the international discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Karen. And John Johnson, anything you want to say to us about that? Uh, I, th I think um, uh, Karen has hit on a very important question, uh, uh, even in the first part of her response, mm -hmm. was about creativity. How, uh, how did China, uh, Chinese artists' creativity um, maintain this momentum, and why well, was there such a such a huge urgency? Um, uh, people felt that they had uh, to express through contemporary art, and uh, pedagogy is one thing. The other, of course, um, is is this um, is this wide difference between the the outside world and the world inside China, and then this huge curiosity when uh, when the so whole social system changed. Uh, radically to 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 uh, to include and embrace the the Western world uh, with a different ideology, different system of doing things, um, a very complete, uh, a very different uh, inst institutional frameworks. I think um, all these confusion and uh, and uh, uh, mind-boggling possibilities was was very much part of that. Um, part of that energy or part of the condition that uh, made this energy um, uh, so urgent and so so radical at the time and uh, so it, it wasn't uh, uh, it, it didn't in but in that in, in that sense in those days it didn't really matter where the, all these materials came from mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and then also any platform uh, artists were, were uh, would be stimulated uh, by whether it, it is a small group show, a commercial gallery exhibition, or the Biennale, or a, a, for most of these artists, um, they, they know some of these exhibitions are very important, or some are less important, but it, it's just this whole sense of a world suddenly opening up. I think that was really the important message that um, uh, Chinese contemporary art of, of the 90s and even into the, uh, the noughties. Uh, was so so um, fascinating for not just China but for everybody else, and uh, I think interpretations and misinterpretations um, uh, by uh, both by Chinese artists and Chinese curators and also outside, um, in a way they're all equally valid because um, mm. it, it is like um, um, different cultural values, um, worlds in. Co collision and worlds trying to blend together. Um, that was really the exciting thing and, and Ch uh, China um, uh, articulated very, very well through this very diverse and very um, chaotic um, creative uh, art scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think um, that only started to settle down and change to something very different uh, with the new um, art academy institutions uh, the new exhibition systems and uh, uh, things that went into uh, that uh, were put into place in the in the mid noughties and and uh, in the last fifteen years. Mm, okay. Yes. It's, um, I, I think. Um, yeah. I think it's really important to have two world views. You know, China's always Chinese art has always been um, obviously trying to adapt to the Western system, but at the same time, they're trying to find their own identity as well. And and I think you know I think there are certain artists and curators are thinking about you know evaluating or reviewing uh, you know whether the Western system really is, is it what they want or should we be thinking about uh, developing a, a, a system for Chinese art I don't know like it could it could happen that way as well so so yeah I think th this whole thing is still very much evolving and I, I it will be interesting to see in about fifteen or 10, 15 years time. Okay, so I have a last question. Uh, it's about um, 
uh, technology. But before that, I just sort of, sort of want to say back in uh, the 90s, obviously, we didn't have social media or inter internet wasn't even that common, I remember, in the early 90s. And so how did um, the public and uh, private institutions used to promote their artists and exhibitions? Maybe you can tell us about it. And also what I'm interested here is um, what do you think about the whole technology, how that how to uh, obviously to to disseminate information such as contemporary Chinese art to the outside world to to the general public. And finally, I wanted to know what do you think about the metaverse in the art world and how that will actually can maybe change the way we work or how artists will practice. I want to know all of these if you can maybe you can share with us your you know your thoughts on that. Maybe Johnson, you can start first. You're on the screen. Um, when when I started going, going to, uh, to China in eight, uh, to, to, look, to look at our studios in the 80s and, and the 90s, well, there, was, there was no telephone. <laughs> um, and uh, right. so even making an appointment was enormously difficult. You had to write letters um, and then people have you take you there. And not only do you, uh, and I think, um, let me try to remember if, if, if um, uh, Hong Kong had this huge mobile phones, but I don't know, I don't, I don't remember it actually Yes, actually, there were phones that would work. These mobile phones, these huge, uh, it's like a tiny little computer you have to carry around. Um, uh, they, uh, it would work inside China, it's, it's the mobile, but it was hugely expensive. And also, um, contacting artists was useless because people were living in these big, um, uh, big uh, compounds, and um, they would be lucky to have one phone in the entire compound. There would be like 20 families sharing a phone. So... Um, uh, so it was a kind of a uh, communication through writing, through uh, uh, information traveling down the grapevine, and somebody hears that um, somebody from outside uh, is coming to visit so and so, and then everybody gather, and um, so um, uh, so it, 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 it is a world that was very much connected by uh, a, a system even older than what we're familiar with. Um, before the, the the mobile phone in uh, let alone the the, um, the internet and uh, oh, well that, that's actually one major transformation but how we deal with um, the, this uh, change um, uh, I, I think um, what we're seeing uh, in China uh, the the speed which the society has changed, and the um, and how quickly um, China has caught up in technology, has caught up in uh, building infrastructure, um, and caught up with um, the the the, this, uh, the way of uh, doing things and Western type of technology. Um, uh, I think this this kind of acceleration, uh, in a way, very much reflects what modern China is about. Anyway, um, after all, starting from from Mao Zedong, the whole idea about uh, about changing China was about acceleration, and now, of course, we realize that uh, um, it is actually more difficult to decelerate than to accelerate because if you decelerate, you might crash, and. Uh, I think that that is one of the big challenge of, of technology today. It's not whether you can do it, but but uh, whether you can afford to try to change it to a different type of technology. And uh, um, art, of course, is something um, that is inseparable from new tools that that that, that change man's ability to sense the world. Uh, it, after all, art is about sensibility, um, and uh, um, so there was a lot of work for artists to do in China, um, and it is not just about how to use technology. We, uh, artists who just focus on using technology is basically they're being used by technology. Um, it uh, it is more important today, really, to think through art itself, uh, art and aesthetics ex itself, and uh, how how that can in fact change technology the, uh, from the other way, from the, from the user's point of view, from the aesthetic's point of view, from the human point of view. Thank you, Jonathan. That's an interesting take on the technology. Uh, on the technology? 
Is it working, my speakers? I hope it is. Okay, Karen, what about you? Um, I would say that the art world from the late 80s through the 90s would have been very, very different if we had had social media. Um, <laughs> and I think that it's thankful that we didn't because what we see now is actually something more of a fragmentation or a slight kind of withdrawal from the public sphere. I think in the, in the 1980s and 90s, people could be, as I mentioned, it was all about community and you had a lot of artists who could come together in, to, you know, and they had means, you know, people would go and knock on each other's doors or, um, you know, they take a bicycle and they'd cycle over to somebody's house, pick up someone, cycle somewhere else. So people wrote a lot of letters as well. They were really in communication with each other. Strangely, perhaps even more than perhaps artists speak to each other today. And I think that it was because of this sense of smallness, manageableness. Um, you know, there is this sort of idea about how many people we can have within our social networks that we are familiar with, that we know, that we can manage before things become unmanageable. So in that, in that period of time, people knew each other and they knew each other very well. And they were comfortable being able to experiment in all kinds of ways. I mean, I think a lot of the performance art that happened in the 90s could not have happened if there had been social media because it would have been um, you know, seen by the wrong kind of people and it would have been kind of closed down a lot sooner than it did as a general mm. movement rather than just in individual <laughs> activities. I think that this is really important to remember. And we can kind of see that with the younger artists today that people use social media. It's become a wonderful tool for us to know about exhibitions happening all over China. Um, but it's a little bit like that kind of very first moment when you had a telephone connection from one side of the world to the other. You had to have something to say, right? You, you, and, and that kind of pressure to communicate when you're aware of sort of communicating for the sake of it or performing communication. This is something that's become very strange within the social media world in China. I mean, we had that whole kind of era of selfies, which I know has been elsewhere in the world. But this kind of awareness of self and then the pushback from people that you don't know criticizing things, whether it's, you know, art or an idea or something, has been the reason that I mentioned perhaps has been with withdrawal. And I certainly know that if you talk to artists today, they're very resistant to being on social media and to being filmed doing talks you know like so often I mean we're doing one here but we always say but so often you feel that um you're not quite sure who's out there who's listening whereas when you're in a lecture theater you see people you know who you're talking to you can kind of get the vibe from the room and you know if your speakers are engaged with what you're saying whereas in these kind of conditions it's really really difficult so i think technology has both huge advantages um, especially during a covid time the fact that we can even speak to each other has been wonderful um, but at the same time you know we are losing something by not having in-person communication in the same way that we lose a lot if we don't actually get to the museum to see the show you know, there's so many great shows. It's like I, I was uh, recently, the, the first exhibition that I've seen um, since lockdown in Shanghai was actually to go and see the Thomas Demand exhibition that's at UCCA. And you don't get an exhibition like that by seeing it on social media because the work is just, it, you know, you have to see these pictures big to understand how they're made. And that's what art is all about. So I think that this is this is why I, I don't really know how to talk about the metaverse, because to me, this is something where you remove all the substance from art. And to me, that just isn't what art is about. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, you know, I had a studio visit with Lu Yang, uh, the young woman, art, or the young artist who's doing a lot of work in a kind of a gaming metaverse, uh, you know, uh, virtual reality mm -hmm. way. And what she's doing is quite extraordinary. So I think that again, this is an example of technology bringing extraordinarily new platforms to young artists, mm. um, so, you know, good and bad in everything. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. It is always two sides of everything, isn't it? 
Okay, so that's pretty much uh, the end of our, our, my question list of questions. And thank you so much, Karen and Johnson, for uh, par participating in this discussion. Very fascinating. Um, now we're going to move on to the Q&A session. We've got about 20 minutes. So I'm just going to open, the, uh, look at the chat box uh, to see if there's any question. Uh, Angel, do you, um, is there anything coming in at all? Can you tell us? Uh, so far, there are no uh, further questions. No questions? <laughs> I think that tends to happen, doesn't it, after a talk? It's sort of that strange, awkward silence where we're like, come on, guys, you can ask questions, and everyone's yeah. a bit too nervous. <laughs> the, the floor is free. Come on. We want to see some of your questions coming in. If you have some questions. Well, it's a great I, opportunity I, to ask experts. I just experts. say something? Because it's so nice to be here. I'm sorry I was late, but also thanks to Nicole. I was mentioning, <laughs> I mean, we met Martha in 1995 doing a book for Shirney. I met Johnson first, actually, um, who was working towards the exhibition in, um, in Hong Kong that was in the uh, beginning of 1993, who very kindly introduced me both to some artists, but also took me to see works that had come fresh out of China that were in the warehouse that you had, which was <laughs> astonishing. And there were a couple of other galleries that were beginning to show um, art from China in Hong Kong. And then, of course, I met uh, Nicole's father, Manfred, um, at the China Club when he did the first exhibition for um, Liu Da Hong, who I also saw in Now I Live in Shanghai. I saw, saw recently, haven't seen him for a very long time. So yeah. it's, it's extraordinary to think that it's already been 30 years and how much has changed. Because one of the things we didn't touch upon today in talking about institutions and you know you 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 differentiating between commercial galleries is that both abroad and inside China, including galleries you know like Red Gate, um, well the Courtyard, whatever, yeah, but Brian. Other, uh, Long March, all of these early spaces that were involved with Chinese art had multi kind of function in the fact that they were more like art centers, you know, they were connectors, they put on shows for artists that were as edgy as perhaps an art center might be sometimes. They commissioned artists to do things, found opportunities for artists to be in, in um, museum shows in a way that was, you know, uh, quite unimaginable before where, you know, certainly within China, a lot of things were being done more in terms of, um, you know, embassy cultural exchange, which was good, was very good how, how it worked, but it certainly didn't take the art to the platforms um, that some of these uh, events that were instigated by people like Johnson or your father, Manfred, actually managed to achieve. So I think that that's really important to, to mention. Mm. Oh, well, I really appreciate that, Karen, because it's kind of what we're trying to demonstrate is, right. you know, the, the efforts that the gallery put into promoting artists on the international mm. platform was quite significant, right? And it was part of that process where they became internationally recognized. Mm. Um, so I, thank you for mentioning that. And I just love it how, like you said, it's been 30 years. I can't, I just can't believe. Yeah. And then the whole discussion <laughs> about art and the metaverse, uh, you know, when we decided to do this virtual exhibition, I have this conflict too, because of course, when you see an original artwork, that connection you make just doesn't translate virtually. Um, but we're trying to use it as a platform to sort of educate and create a research facility, which is why we're doing the archive for Shirney Art Gallery, yeah. you know, the 20 years. Yeah. So like, like you both said, it's all good and bad on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm not going to wrap it on because I can't tend to do that. I wanted to say thank you so much for joining. Have we got any questions then, Angel? I saw something uh, pop up. Just yeah, now. yeah, we've got we've got two questions. So can I just start? You, Karen and, and Johnson, because I know we've overrun. Do you have a few more minutes just to quickly yeah. do the Q&A? No, Are you no, going to no, get no, quick of, course, of course, I'm very I'm delighted to. Okay, to lovely. Great. Right. Okay, so I've got a, a question from Shona. Um, at, um, at some point, I think I remember someone commenting I think in the media that young people in China were giving up going to business school to become artists as they thought it would be a lucrative career path. Can anyone comment on the commodification of this outsider non-institutional art in China in the 90s, I think, or in the noughties? Anyway, that was the question. 
But just quickly, I think the, the, the thing to remember is that in China, people value education enormously. And so ever since the reinstatement of the high school entrance exams in like 1978, 79, and re-entry into universities. Um, anybody who has the opportunity to try to go into good schools and to good universities will be with their parents beating down the door to, to get in. So we, you know, that's why education across China is just a massive sort of industry. Um, and, and within that, of course, there's a lot of people who perhaps will never get into Beijing. Peking University or Tsinghua or Fudan or any of the good schools, you know, and it's become one of these much talked about social issues is the pressure that young kids are under to take the university entrance exam or even the high school entrance exams. And of course, previously, the parents gave the, you know, you know, the story of the tiger mums, you know, the, the, the parents were giving the kids a lot of pressure because it was only seen that certain uh, subjects would would give you the right career path and art was certainly not a career path that your parents would ever have chosen for you so I think that part of the expansion has been that um, the art schools have become so much more than just places you learn to paint and now they have all kinds of you know like an art school anyway you can study fashion you can do design you can study film and television uh, you study animation you can study metaverse probably so and, and all, all kinds of design skills from industrial design to architecture so i think that this has been you know this putting these classes available to people within the university structure has been a signal that means that for parents it's it's okay that your kids can study these subjects because they will get a university degree when they come out um, and so I think that that's been one of the reasons for the expansion. And also I mentioned early on that there were only ever kind of like a handful of students in the class in the 1980s. Well, by 2000, when there was a big expansion of universities and art schools across the country, you suddenly had 50 kids in a class. Um, and after two, two years, it was discovered that that was just unmanageable and it was reduced again. So I think it's come back down now to about 30 students. But that just shows that, you know, the, the sheer, uh, what do you say, market for places in universities, because there's so many kids who want to get not just the first degree, uh, the good high school, the first degree, the master's degree, but they're also doing PhDs. And if they can't do a PhD, they do a second master's just because education is seen as such an important way to get on in life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. And Johnson? Yeah. If you don't mind me interrupting, sorry, it's true, because if you think about it, almost every single Chinese contemporary artist has come from an academy, which I think is quite, you know, worth yeah. mentioning. And I remember during my gallery days, I would come across artists who started businesses to help students to be able to pass their entrance exams to get <laughs> into the academies mm -hmm. and it, it became actually very yeah. much an industry like a side industry in itself and I think like you're saying you know normally parents mm -hmm. wouldn't encourage art as a direction um, in fact I always joke with my kids mm -hmm. it's very difficult because they're very creative it's very tough to be an artist maybe maybe you know have have think about it twice before you <laughs> want to go down that route but I think at that time like especially in the right. millennia when the market started to boom it did sort of become like an opportunity for a career, a career um, and less so like, yeah. oh, you will struggle as an artist, you know, as a life as an artist. Um, but anyway, sorry, Johnson, what were you going to say? <laughs> you no, know, no, I was, I was enjoying what you were saying. Um, <laughs> I, I certainly think um, uh, this, uh, this vast expansion of, of um, art institutions in China uh, is encouraging. Um, and also this, um, um, this culturalization of a, a lot of professions. Um, we have now specialists in all sorts of design areas. We have specialists in, um, it's, it's almost like as though um, aesthetics is, can, can now be disseminated into many careers and professions. And I think there's a very encouraging thing, especially for a place like China, when uh, where you, you, um, you, you have to, 
prove yourself um, by showing showing a certified degree, and uh, it is it it is a very tough place to survive with with a huge number of um, competitors. But then, of course, we, we we go on nostalgically about the days when the art academies had. Uh, maybe 150 students in the entire art academy, and there were like 300 teachers. And that was, that was a that was really the most luxurious kind of uh, educational experience one one can ask for. And indeed, in the, in the great universities around the world, having that kind of teacher student ratio was uh, is still unimaginable unless you're a PhD student. So um, this also, in a way, explains the quality of, of the artists who actually. Uh, have come through in the, in the 80s, 90s, and in the noughties. Um, they, they, they were already the, the, the best of the best. Um, and um, and they, were, they were the best of the best, not just in art. They were the, they were the best students in their secondary schools. They, they were very smart science students as well. So, um, so the, the big success story of, of uh, Chinese uh, contemporary artists uh, from the 90s onward uh, also has this background that they was just brought up, um, uh, that they they were the people who who were not just um, uh, artists. People have gone through art schools. They have gone through some of the most rigorous competition to get to these schools in in, in China, and uh, and I'm glad to see that today. Um, uh, even if you're not that competitive, you can still get an education in art. <laughs> Okay, well, okay, I've That's got one, one last question. So thank you, Johnson. Um, from Caroline Learn. Um, hi, she said, go back to the 90s. Contemporary art in China was the motivation of the artists, not driven by Chinese government. What if it was driven by the Chinese government? Uh, they can, would, uh, would the arts growing in the same? Would it be, that's basically what she's saying. Uh, uh, Basically, would it be very different if if it's it is actually motivated by the government, the Chinese government? She's, that's her question. I probably wouldn't have contemporary. Well, I mean, that's what I was saying earlier about the type of art that was made in art institutes and supported by the artists' associations. So it would be a very very different kind of art, and basically, you wouldn't have any of the things that we think of as being contemporary today. Yeah, that's straight to the point, Karen. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> True. Okay. Well, I think um, I'm going to, again, I want to thank, I would like to thank Karen um, and Johnson for joining and Martha for moderating. And I love it that I'm in France. Martha, you're in Brisbane. Johnson, you're in Hong Kong. And Karen, you're in China. So <laughs> that's one benefit of technology is that we're able to come together and have this talk. Yeah, and Angel, you're in London, <laughs> so that's yes. across five and, different countries. Um, best part of technology because we are speaking to each other face to face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I think um, that's amazing, and thank you so much again. And then we're actually going to uh, share this recorded session, if that's okay with everybody, because I think some people missed out. Mm -hmm. And yes. um, yeah. All right, brilliant. Okay. Martha, do you have anything to say? Right. I sort of jumped in and took your role of closing the talk. <laughs> okay. You can be the moderator. No, I'm all good. So <laughs> Angel, maybe you can uh, give us a little bit of your spill for, um, to conclude this uh, webinar, please. Thank you. <laughs> yes, actually we are doing another public programs uh, for our exhibitions. So tomorrow, uh, we Nicole and I will be meeting people in our virtual project space called SPXR, where the uh, Man First Journey Love Art and Legacy Chinese Contemporary Art Collection exhibition will be there. So uh, I just put down the link in the description box. So uh, feel free to register your seats. But if you want, if you're interested, you, uh, I suggest book your tickets now because uh, it's only allowed 20 people maximum in the space at a time. And if you have any questions, you can also email us um, in the inquiry email as well. And we yeah, also have I a think new everything's talk. Everything's on our website. Yeah. Mm. And we also have uh, another talk about art in metaverse slash web 3.0. It will be in uh, mid August. So 
check out our social media and our news sign up to our newsletter to right. wait for the announcement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Wish you a nice evening, day, afternoon, you. wherever you are. Thank you, Karen. And thank you so much again. And thank you for everyone Karen, watching. So thank you. Yeah.